Hello everyone, and welcome to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen, and I'm filling in for Pamela Clark, the director of New Heights Educational Group, and the radio show as radio host for the New Heights Show on Education and the New Heights Educational Group. I hope you enjoy the show, and I'm asking our listeners to consider becoming a sponsor. This show is pre-recorded and will be on the topic of learning loss in school, schools due to the pandemic. The first article is taken from www.worldbank.org slash en slash news slash press release slash 2021 slash 12 slash 06 slash learning losses from COVID-19 could cost this generation of students close to 17 trillion in lifetime earnings. World Bank, UNESCO, UNICEF report lays out the magnitude of the education crisis. Washington DC, December the 6th, 2021. This generation of students now risks losing 17 trillion in lifetime earnings in present value or about 14% of today's global GDP as a result of COVID-19 pandemic-related school closures, according to a new report published today by the World Bank, UNESCO, and UNICEF. The new projection reveals that the impact is more severe than previously thought and far exceeds the 10 trillion estimates released in 2020. In addition, The State of the Global Education Crisis, a Path to Recovery report shows that in low and middle income countries, the share of children living in learning poverty already 53% before the pandemic could potentially reach 70% given the long school closures and the ineffectiveness of remote learning to ensure full learning continuity during school closures. The COVID-19 crisis brought education systems across the world to a halt, said Jaime Saavedra, World Bank Global Director for Education. Now, 21 months later, schools remain closed for millions of children and others may never return to school. The loss of learning that many children are experiencing is morally unacceptable and the potential increase of learning poverty might have a devastating impact on future productivity, earnings and well-being for this generation of children and youth, their families and the world's economies. Simulations estimating that school closures resulted in significant learning losses are now being corroborated by real data. For example, regional evidence from Brazil, Pakistan, rural India, South Africa, and Mexico, among others, show substantial losses in math and reading. Analysis shows that in some countries, on average, learning losses are roughly proportional to to the length of the closures. However, there was great heterogeneity across countries and by subject, students, socioeconomic status, gender, and grade level. For example, results from two states in Mexico show significant learning losses in reading and in math for students aged 10 to 15. The estimated learning losses were greater in math than reading and affected younger learners, students from low-income backgrounds as well as girls disproportionately. Barring a few exceptions, the general trends from emerging evidence around the world align with the findings from Mexico, suggesting that the crisis has exacerbated inequities in education. Children from low-income households, children with disabilities, and girls were less likely to access remote learning than their peers. This was often due to lack of accessible technologies and the availability of electricity, connectivity, and devices, as well as discrimination and gender norms. Younger students had less access to remote learning and were more affected by learning loss than older students especially among preschool aged children in pivotal learning and development stages. 
the detrimental impact on learning has disproportionately affected the most marginalized or vulnerable. Learning losses were greater for students of lowest socioeconomic status in countries like Ghana, Mexico, and Pakistan. Initial evidence po points to larger losses among girls as they are quickly losing the protection that schools and learning offers to their well-being and life chances. The COVID-19 the COVID pandemic shut down schools across the world, disrupting education for 1.6 billion students at its peak and exacerbated the gender divide. In some countries, we're seeing greater learning losses among girls and an increase in the risk of facing child labor, gender-based violence, early marriage, and pregnancy. To stem the scars on this generation, we must reopen schools and keep them open, target outreach to return learners to school, and accelerate learning recovery, said UNICEF Director of Education, Robert Jenkins. The report highlights that to date, Less than 3% of government stimulus packages have been allocated to education. Much more funding will be needed for immediate learning recovery. The report also notes that while ne nearly every country in the world offered remote learning opportunities for students, the quality and reach of such initiatives differed. In most cases, they offered at best a rather partial su substitute for in-person instruction, more than 200 million learners live in low and lower middle income countries that are unprepared to deploy remote learning during emergency school closures. Reopening schools must remain a top and urgent priority globally to stem and reverse learning. Losses. Countries should put in place learning recovery programs with the objective of assuring that students of this generation attain at least the same competencies of the previous generation. Programs must cover three key lines of action to recover learning. One, consolidating the curriculum. Two, extending instructional time. And three, improving the efficiency of learning. In terms of improving the efficiency of learning, Techniques like targeted instruction can help learning recovery, which means that teachers align instruction to the learning level of students, rather than an assumed starting point or curricular expectation. Targeted instruction will require addressing the learning data crisis by assessing students' learning levels. It also necessitates additional support to teachers so that they are well equipped to teach to the level of where children are which is crucial to prevent losses from accumulating once children are back in school. We are committed to supporting governments more generally with their COVID response through the Mission Recovery Plan launched earlier this year, emphasized Stefania Gianni, UNESCO Assistant Director General for Education. With government leadership and support from the international community, there is a great deal that can be done to make systems more equitable, efficient and resilient, capitalizing on lessons learned throughout the pandemic and an increasing investments. But to do that, we must make children and youth a real priority amidst all the other demands of the pandemic response. Their future and our collective future depends on it. To build more resilient education systems for the long term, countries should consider investing in the enabling environment to unlock the potential of digital learning opportunities for all students, reinforcing the role of parents, families and communities in children's learning, ensuring teachers have support and access to high quality professional development opportunities, increasing the share of education in the national budget allocation of stimulus packages. This report was produced as part of the Mission Recovering Education 2021 by which the World Bank, UNESCO and UNICEF are focused on three priorities, bringing all children back to schools, recovering learning losses and preparing and supporting teachers. For more information, please visit the State of the Global Education Crisis, A Path to Recovery, www.worldbank.org education. 
The next article is from www.unicef.org slash press releases slash learning loss must be recovered avoid long-term damage children's dash well-being dash and learning loss must be recovered to avoid long-term damage to children's well-being and productivity new report says new recommendation for the global education evidence advisory panel in parenthesis g-e-e-a-p offer guidance on how to recover learning and prevent further loss including prioritizing the full open the full reopening of schools 26th of january 2022 florence slash london slash new york slash washington dc 26th of january 2022 school closures have caused large and persistent damage to children's learning and well-being the cost of which will be felt for decades to come According to a new report launched today by the Global Education Evidence Advisory Panel in parenthesis GEEAP, co-hosted by the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, UNICEF, Office of Research Innocente, and the World Bank. Prioritizing learning during COVID-19 presents the latest data on the impact of school closures on children. Estimates suggest that without urgent action, a grade three child who has lost one year of schooling during the pandemic could lose up to three years worth of learning in the long run. Learning losses due to school closures are one of the biggest global threats to medium and long-term recovery from COVID-19. The evidence tells us that schools need to reopen and be kept open as far as possible and steps need to be taken in reintegrating children back into the school system, said Abhijit. Banerjee, co-chair of the GEAAP, Dr. Banerjee, who shared the 2019 Economics Nobel Prize in part for his work in education, is one of the 15 education experts from around the world who produced the second annual GEAAP report. The economic costs of lost learning from the crisis will be severe. A recent estimate, estimation predicts a USD 17 trillion loss in lifetime earnings among today's generation of school children if corrective action is not urgently taken. While many other sectors have rebounded when lockdowns ease, the damage to children's education is likely to reduce children's well-being, including mental health and productivity for decades, making education disruption one of the biggest threats to medium and long-term recovery from COVID-19 unless governments act swiftly, said Kwam. A Yem Pong panel co-chair. Low and middle income countries and children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds have been the hardest hit. The report notes schools have on average been closed for longer than in high than in high income countries. Students have had less or no access to technology during school closures and there has been less adaptation to the challenges of the crisis. Evidence is mounting of the low effectiveness of remote learning efforts. In Sao Paulo, Brazil, for example, grade 5 students in remote classes learned nearly 75% less and were 2.5 times more likely to drop out. Emergent data on learning loss shows grade 4 students in South Africa having lost at least 62% of a year of learning due to school closures, and students in rural Karnataka. India are estimated to have lost a full year. The increase in education inequality that COVID-19 has created across and within countries is not only a problem in its own right, varied learning levels in the classroom makes it more difficult for teachers to help most students catch up, especially the most marginalized. While schools must be the first to open as restrictions are lifted, recovering the loss that children have experienced requires far more than simply reopening classrooms. School children need intensive support to get back on track. Teachers need access to quality training and resources and education systems need to be transformed, said Robert Jenkins, UNICEF Director of Education. Over 1.6 billion school children globally were shut out of school at the height of the pandemic, compounding the learning crisis poor countries were already facing 
said Vicky Ford, MP, UK Minister for Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, ahead of the report launched today. My priority in the coming year is to ensure as many children as possible globally get back to school and back to high quality learning. The report identifies four urgent recommendations made by the panel in parenthesis GEEAP to help prevent further loss and recover children's education. Prioritize keeping schools and preschools fully open. The large educational, economic, social and mental health costs of school closures and the inadequacy of remote learning strategies as substitutes for in-person learning make it clear that school closure should be a last resort. Prioritize teachers for the COVID-19 vaccination, provide and use masks where assessed as appropriate and improve ventilation. While not prerequisites to reopening schools, the risk of transmission in schools can be sharply reduced when a combined set of mitigating actions such as using quality masks and ventilation are taken. Adjust instruction to support the learning needs of children and focus on important foundational skills. It is critical to assess students' learning levels as schools reopen. Targeting instruction tailored to a child's learning level has been shown to be cost-effective at helping students catch up, including grouping children by level all day or part of the day. Governments must ensure teachers have adequate support to help children learn. Interventions that provide teachers with carefully structured and simple pedagogy programs have been found to cost-effectively increase literacy and numeracy, particularly when combined with accountability, feedback and monitoring mechanisms. The expert panel also calls on governments to build on the lessons learned during school closures by supporting parental engagement and leveraging existing technology. We must continue to sound the alarm on the crisis in education and ensure that policymakers have clear evidence for how to recover the catastrophic learning losses and prevent a lost generation, said Jaime Saavedra, panel member and global director for education at the World Bank. Right now, you might be struggling through your classes or even failing them. You might be worried that you may not finish high school. There might have even been a thought that you may not be smart enough. Well, the New Heights Educational Group begs to differ. We not only think you are smart enough, but with our help, you will complete your high school diploma. The New Heights Educational Group strives to improve your academic success through its tutoring services. To learn more, please visit newheightseducation.org and contact us. New Heights Educational Group educational resources to help reach your goals. Hello, listeners. If you're enjoying the New Heights show on education and want to support or donate to our organization, please visit www.newheightseducation.org. And while you're there, check out our online store back to the New Heights Show on Education. My name is Barbara Bullen and I'm the radio host for this show, filling in for Pamela Clark, Director of New Heights Educational Group and the radio show. This show is pre-recorded and will continue on the subject of learning loss in schools due to the pandemic. Taken from an article www.the74million.org slash article slash analysis dash pandemic dash learning loss could res- could cost US students two trillion in lifetime earnings what state schools can do to avert this crisis. The 74 dash analysis pandemic learning loss could cost US students two trillion in lifetime earnings what states and schools can do to avert this crisis December the 13th 2021. Dan Goldharber and Thomas Kane and Andrew McEachin. Dan Goldhaber is director of the Center for Analysis of Longitudinal Data in Education Research at the American Institutes for Research and of the Center for Education Data and Research at the University of Washington. Thomas J. Kane is the Walter H. Gale Professor of Education and Economics at Harvard University and faculty director 
of Center for Education Policy Research, which works with school agencies through its strategic data project, Proving Ground, National Center for Rural Education Research Networks and other research projects. Andrew McEachin is director of the Collaborative for Student Growth at NWEA, a nonprofit assessment provider. Over the past two years, virtually every American has suffered loss. Many have lost loved ones, others have lost jobs or homes. In most instances, the only option is to accept fate and try to return to a sense of normalcy. However, when it comes to addressing students' learning loss, we must resist the temptation to try to get back to normal. Returning to a normal school routine without addressing lost learning opportunities would leave millions of students permanently behind. Doing what's right by kids will require massive national effort over and above what's considered normal to provide additional instructional time over the next two years. It's difficult to convey the magnitude of students' learning loss in a manner that galvanizes action. This week, the nonprofit testing company NWEA reported that the median student in grades 3 to 8 returns to school this fall 9 to 11 percentile points behind in math and 3 to 7 percentile points behind in reading. For most people, such numbers fail to convey the magnitude of the loss and the scale of the effort needed to address it. It's like hearing that the price of gas is rising, denominated in Albanian leaks or Algerian diners. One way to make the magnitude more tangible is to restate the loss in terms of students' future earnings, using the relationship between achievement test scores and earnings among those already in the workforce a 9 to 11 percentile point decline in math achievement, parenthesis, if allowed to become permanent, would, would represent a $43,800 loss in expected lifetime earnings. Spread across the 50 million public school students currently enrolled in, in grades K to 12, that would be over 2 trillion, about 10 times more than $200 billion, Congress set aside last year to help schools respond to the pandemic. Another way to express the loss in terms of typical academic growth per week during a normal school year, in grades four and five, it would take an additional eight to 10 weeks of instruction to cover the loss in reading and math, respectively. In grades six through eight, where the material is more complex and students' rate of progress slows, it would take an additional 14 and 18 weeks of instruction to cover those losses in reading and math respectively. Schools could compensate for that deficit without literally extending the school year. With tutors, extra periods of instruction in math and reading, Saturday academies, and after-school programs. However, no one should expect to produce the equivalent of 8 to 19 instructional weeks just by asking teachers to run a few review sessions and to generally pick up the pace. Yet for most students, that's what the academic catch-up strategy seems to be so far. Here's a more disturbing fact. A large body of evidence is showing that students in high poverty schools, students of color, and white students who were scoring below grade level before the pandemic have lost the most ground academically. Perhaps, most surprisingly, those white and Asian students who were scoring in the top quartile before the pandemic have returned to school this fall on track with no loss in expected growth, as if there had been no pandemic. In other words, communities of color and those experiencing poverty have not only borne the brunt of job and wage losses, but their children have borne the brunt of the academic losses as well. In many places, local schools are still bogged down with immediate concerns, such as whether to require masks, whether to shut down in the face of COVID outbreaks and how to get back to normal. Federal and state policymakers can help by requiring local leaders to look, to look down the road and begin planning more ambitious catch-up efforts for this summer and next school year. To start, states should quantify the magnitude of pandemic learning losses. They should suspend their old accountability measures and replace them with specific targets for each school and district to bring students back up to their pre-pandemic performance by spring 2024 as a floor 
not a ceiling. For the next two years, all eyes should be focused on getting students back to pre-COVID academic levels. Second, state governments should be preparing to target their remaining federal dollars to schools and student groups with continuing achievement losses. Last spring's American Rescue Plan required states to allocate 90% of the new federal dollars using established formulas, but that was before anyone knew which schools and students had lost the most ground over the past two years. States should hold back much of the remaining 10% until the achievement data clarify which students are still lagging behind. Third, education leaders should use this summer and next fall to track the efficiency of their recovery efforts. The federal government is largely to, to blame for the absence of a learning plan. It did not specify which data districts should be collecting. In the coming months, the Biden administration should provide guidance to districts about tracking the attendance of students in each type of intervention and linking those data with student outcomes. Local leaders must be prepared to update, adjust and expand their academic recovery efforts over the, over the next two years. To do that, they will need to know which students are engaged in each type of intervention and which approaches are associated with the largest achievement gains. Our research team is working with 12 large public school districts to compare the achievement growth of students receiving various types of interventions from tutoring to Saturday academics to after school programs. We are proud that our district partners, even without federal guidance, foresaw the need for better tracking so they could adjust their plans by scaling, scaling up their most effective programs. We will be sharing what we learn as we go. Teachers, parents and students are exhausted. Even if their schools return to a normal schedule, most students will remain behind at the end of the will remain behind at the end of the current academic year. But rather than wait for next spring's state test to confirm that news, local school districts should be planning now to ramp up their catch-up efforts this summer and next fall to provide supplemental instruction at the scale necessary to make students whole. Meanwhile, State and federal government should make sure they have a plan in place to determine which local interventions are making the most difference and to share what they are learning with local decision makers. If we do not act decisively now, if we try simply to get back to normal and allow these learning losses to become permanent, we will be solidifying what's been a dramatic increase in educational inequity. The next article is taken from US News www.usnews.com slash education dash news slash articles slash 2022 dash 04 dash 08 slash addressing learning loss in disadvantaged kids. Addressing learning loss in disadvantaged kids. School leaders with hundreds of billions of dollars in federal COVID-19 aid are ramping up plans to offer summer school and tutoring programs in an effort to recoup learning losses by Lauren Camara, April the 8th, 2022 at 8 a.m. Students with disabilities, those learning English and students who live in rural communities learn at the same rate during the academic year and often faster than their peers who are not disadvantaged, but they lose much more ground over the summer according to new research from the nonprofit education policy an assessment organization, NWEA. The finding bolsters calls by Education Secretary Miguel Cardona for state education officials and school leaders to offer intensive summer learning programs for students who have incurred the steepest academic losses due to chronic interruption to learning during the pandemic. Historically, underserved students can grow academically at the same pace or faster than their peers in the school year, says Lindsay Dworkin, Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at NWEA. Prior to this research, it's been unclear what the school year versus summer growth trajectories have been and where we are losing ground. This research puts a big spotlight on summer and the need to do better over the summer for these students. 
While education policymakers and school districts have a solid grasp of the setbacks experienced by students of color, less research exists on how learning interruptions have dwarfed the academic achievements of students with disabilities, those still learning English, and students from rural communities. The new research for, from NWEA uses data available on the learning loss that these groups of students experienced during summer breaks prior to the pandemic to extra extrapolate what pandemic-related learning loss might look like for them. Its researchers also analyze the learning patterns of each student subgroup to better understand where and when they fall behind. For example, in the study of K-8 students nationwide, rural students entered kindergarten with higher achievement levels in math and reading than their non-rural peers. But by the end of third grade, non-rural students consistently outperformed those from rural communities across the grades. The report found that rural students grow at slightly faster rates in math and reading than other students when school is in session, but they lose more ground almost every summer. For students with disabilities, a study of K-4 students nationwide shows that they enter kindergarten behind their peers in reading and math but go, on to make plan but go on to make gains at similar or higher rates than their peers during some school years. The group's biggest challenge is that they lose more ground every, sum every summer, which has contributed and compounded to widening disparities in achievement. Another research study that focused on achievement and growth for English learners in K-4 showed that they had lower test scores than their peers through their elementary school years but that they also made academic growth similar to or at, a gr or, or at greater levels. However, similarly to students with disabilities, students who are still learning English tend to lose more ground over the summer than their non-English learning peers. Now, as the third year of pandemic schooling begins to wind down, school leaders empowered by hundreds of billions of dollars in federal government and federal COVID-19 aid are ramping up plans to offer summer school and tutoring programs in an effort to recoup some of those learning losses. There are plenty of resources, Dworkin says, and to the extent that money can solve the problem and there are no easy answers, there are a lot of federal recovery resources at the disposal of districts and states to move heaven and earth to make this possible. An early analysis of how school districts are spending the federal aid from the American Rescue Plan from Future Aid, an education policy organization housed in Georgetown's University's McCourt School of Public Policy, shows that roughly 30% of the funding is going towards academic recovery. According to the analysis, schools have spent more than $1.7 in one-time funding for tutoring and coaching a sum that is projected to grow to $3.6 billion by the time federal coronavirus relief aid to education expires in 2024. But a whole, whole host of difficulties stand in the way of getting such services to students, even among the most well-laid plans, including staff and store shortages, teacher burnout, transportation challenges, and the voluntary nature of the programs that make enrolling students difficult. In Newark, for example, where roughly 45% of the district's 38,000 children have a first language other than English, including 10% of K-12 students who do not speak English well, according to federal data, and where 9% of students have a disability, the results for mid-year assessments are alarming. Education officials expect just 6% of students in grades 3 through 7 to reach proficiency on end-of-year state math tests based on those mid-year assessments compared to 27% who met proficiency prior to the pandemic in 2019. Students are staring down a similar fate with reading, with 10% students in grades 1 through 7 expected to reach proficiency. Like many urban school districts with a growing population of English learners and students with disabilities, Newark has struggled New, <clears throat> Newark has struggled to hire enough specialized teachers 
and is still contending with major disruptions, including as recently as January, when the district was forced to pivot to remote, to remote learning during the surge in the Omicron variant. And according to district data, more than 35% of students were chronically absent in February, another pandemic-related setback with which many city school systems are contending. With the 282 million Newark will receive in federal pandemic aid, education officials plan to expand summer school and tutoring programs and hire additional teaching specialists to work one-on-one -on -one with students, which Cardona has asked all school districts to prioritize. But as it stands, Newark is making after-school tutoring and summer school optional, optional, relying on students to opt into them rather than incorporating them into the school year as a requirement for students. Some education policy experts say that while the intent is good, and to some extent districts can't adopt such requirements due to staffing challenges or union contracts, the voluntary nature of the academic enrichment, enrichment programs means many students will miss out. A recent analysis of its after-school programs by Chalkbeat found that the district only served 3,800 elementary school students per day, or about 16% of those children. And while some schools also offered tutoring during the day, the analysis concluded that it was unclear whether the offering qualified as a high dosage tutoring that Cardona has called for and research shows is most effective, like programs that include multiple small group sessions per week. This information demonstrates that our system is effective at educating our students during the school year and it is a call to action for states and districts on how to target summer programming so that all students can excel in school and beyond. Deborah Delisley, CEO of All 4 Ed and a former education department official during the Obama administration, says of the NWEA report, our children deserve nothing less. But even programs specifically designed for students with disabilities or those still learning English are running into uptake problems. In New York City, where former Mayor Bill de Blasio directed $200 million in, in July for every school to establish a special education recovery program that offers after-school and Saturday services, including intensive tutoring and speech and physical therapy sessions, Many schools didn't get those programs up and running until December, and some lasted just 10 weeks. Staffing challenges and lack of bus transportation further crippled participation. While city officials have said the programs are open to all of the city's 192,000 students with disabilities, they also expect just 35% of them to participate. What's unclear? and concerning to school leaders based on, based on early evidence from school systems like Newark and New York is how impactful and long-lasting the programs those dollars are supporting will be. A powerhouse of K-12 leaders and policy experts led by Kevin Huffman, the former Tennessee Commissioner of Education, and Janice Jackson, the former Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public Schools, announced earlier this week that they're closing in on their goal to raise $100 million to address that very problem by scaling cost-effective yet impactful tutoring models they hope to embed in schools for the long haul. The evidence is clear, Cardona said earlier this week. High-impact tutoring works, and I've urged our nation's schools to provide every student who is struggling with extended access to an effective tutor we must seize this moment to use federal relief funds to help students, including those most impacted by this pandemic, to close gaps in opportunity and achievement that grew even wider over the last two years, he said. This comes to the conclusion of the show. Thank you for listening. You can reach me by email, barbara b at newheightseducation.org. Be sure to join the pre-recorded show every Wednesday by 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at radio.newheightseducation.org where educational topics will be, will be discussed. Have a great week.
We hope you enjoyed today's show. Don't forget to rate us and follow us on your podcast player. Check out our show page, radio.newheightseducation.org, for monthly announcements and other happenings.